Bibles with me this morning to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9. We're going to be going through that this morning. If anybody needs a Bible, please raise your hand because we would love to have you use a Bible during service as we're going to be completing chapter 9 this morning, I pray. Verses 36 through, I think it's 60. Thirty-seven, actually. You know, there are some things now that, uh, as I digress for a moment here, um, there are things that that come across me as a pastor of a church many times. Things that are really very joyful and things that at times um, uh, kind of break my heart or... They um, just, just, you know, just things that you don't expect at times. You know, and as I've been doing my devotional times of study, uh, Lord has had me in uh, 1 Corinthians, and I've been studying through 1 Corinthians devotionally for myself, and he led me to this verse, um, in chapter 4, verse 2, it says, as Paul is speaking to those in the church in Corinth, he says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. And as some news was brought to me a little while ago, I, I, I just thought about that verse, and I thought about this individual in, in, just immediately. This is, what I'm about to say this morning is for the church family here in Williamsburg, for all of you guests and visitors and visiting families from other places who frequent us, this, this isn't for you, but as we're called to do in a church when there is the need and the necessity for um, uh, bringing up areas of housekeeping, bringing up what I call housekeeping, uh, bringing up areas of change in uh, church leadership that would affect the families here at Calvary Chapel, Williamsburg. It's important that we give full disclosure and that we give uh, just everything to be above reproach and everything to be done in the light. So, um, again, this is for the church family here at Calvary Chapel uh, because uh, it's, it's important that, that each of you know that as I read that verse, I want you to know this that a few months ago, I had been praying with one of our leaders in the church about some situations. And this leader then came to me about a month ago and had asked that he step down from leadership. And, you know, whenever that happens, um, I find it can go two ways. One way is that I can get really kind of bad and really kind of ugly within the fellowship and that maybe folks won't entirely understand. Well, number one, it's not their business to understand as far as I'm concerned. But number two, um, the other ways that it goes, it goes the way that it should. And I praise the Lord that in this instance, it's gone the way that it should. And that it's gone the way of the Bible. It's gone biblically, which I really, really rejoice over. And it's only in those times when we stick to the precepts of the Word of God and when we, even against our own thoughts and against our own innate feelings, we follow the Word of God, that it always will turn out for the better. It's maybe not always pleasant, but it will turn out for the better. Because it's always the best when we follow the Word of God. Here at Calvary Chapel, we follow the Word of God. We follow the Word of God when it comes to times of, of encouragement, exhortation. As the Word of God has given us, as the Bible says, instruction in righteousness. And so that means either discipline or that means training. And so with that, the Word of God is our guideline. It's our plumb line. It's our standard of which we follow. And so again, 
I, I wanted to say that this brother had come to me and he asked to step down from leadership. And I want to let you know this because this brother is one who you know in the fellowship and he's prominent in the way, in the manner of where he serves in the fellowship. And uh, with that, it's important and I want to put down any rumors, I want to put down any gossip, any murmuring, because we're an open book. And I believe that's the way it should be. Above reproach, without a hint of sin, it must be brought before the body. And because this individual is known within the fellowship, and he would be stepping down upon his own accord, I wanted to let you all know that we love him and that he will continue in fellowship with us and that this is his desire. And he had led our youth group for the past four years and his name is Keith Grant. You know him. And so Keith has asked to step down because there are some things that he needs to take care of personally. And I believe that's the better thing to do in Keith's situation. As Keith and I have been praying these many months alongside one another, lifting his arms up, praying, seeking the Lord's guidance, God has ultimately prevailed in the message he's given to Keith and the word he's given to Keith, and I rejoice in that, guys. And so I'm very blessed as he came to me, his pastor, and asked, explain the situation. And of course, of course, it is something that I see the Lord has put upon his heart. Keith has served in the ministry here for the past almost five years. It's gone by really quick. He's going to continue to serve here in whatever capacity the Lord brings him to. And at which point, the Lord speaks to his heart again. Then because in the way of which he's done this, he is always welcome back into the area of leadership, into the area of overseeing, Because the Bible says that before you lay hands on anyone, you must have a good testimony. And by Keith doing what he has done in coming to me, in the fashion that he has done it, that's a good testimony, guys. And so it's his testimony that will precede him here in this place. And so we love him, and we're going to be bummed because he, well, I don't know, I'll be a little happy because he eats more pizza at the leadership meetings than anybody else. But you know what? He'll be missed, no doubt. So I didn't want you parents who have your children in our youth group to wonder, why is Pastor Tom there now? And where is Keith? So I wanted to give you full disclosure and 100% communication. Amen, guys? Amen. Let's get into the Word this morning. Luke chapter 9. We're going to begin at verse 37 this morning. You know, the teachings of Jesus, show me your hands, okay? How many of you love the teachings of Jesus? Woo, okay, who's not raising their hands? You need to talk to me after church, man. No, it's, it's like, yeah, we love the teachings of Jesus, do we not? But how many of us love the teachings of Jesus when he asks us to do the difficult thing? when he asks us to do something that is totally against your grain, when it's totally against what you really want to do yourself. You see, because when you read the teachings of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, they fly into the face of all the world. Do they not? 
They are right in the face of the things of the world. The teachings of Jesus are so incredibly radical. They're so radical because they're so different from what we may hear or what is innately inside of us, our flesh, the things that we want to do, the things that we think we should be doing or we feel we should be doing. Jesus, his teachings are the antithesis, the opposite of the world. And that's why I say they're so very, very radical. Jesus says, hey, listen, if you're meek, you'll inherit the earth. Go figure that one. Jesus says, if you desire to be last, you'll be first. And then Jesus also says, be a servant. See, to me, this makes no sense. Jesus, I say, Jesus, don't you know? Don't you know what it takes to operate into this world? Don't you know what, it, what I must do to, to function in this world today? It's not about being meek. It's about being strong. Jesus, don't you know that might makes right to be successful in the world? You must flex your muscles, right? Isn't that what it's about? Being top of the heap, top of the hill. Well, historically, I was thinking about this, and historically, there's only one person that I know who really demonstrated this outwardly and who totally, totally took the words of Jesus at his word and he practiced those words. This man had the gall or the gumption, you might call it, to take Jesus at his word and prove his words to be true. This man, he wasn't a believer of Jesus Christ, but found the teachings of Jesus so radical and so profound and powerful. This man I speak of is Gandhi. Virtually this man single-handedly embraced what Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount. And from the greatest military force at that time, being England, the empire totally crumbled in the face of this skinny little Indian guy. You know the story. You know what the history books say. Maybe you've seen the movie. See, and the words of Jesus were proved at that time that the meek shall indeed inherit the earth. The, the English didn't know what to do. They wouldn't come against them because they were passive. They didn't fight back. They were confused. That was what Gandhi had said to the people. Do not resist. Do not fight. Be meek. I believe this. You may agree with me or not. If people will dare to take Jesus literally and become the servant of all, they will find themselves then to be the greatest. Being willing to to be the last. They shall be first. I suggest and I put this to you this morning. Jesus is going to say in the word here, in verse 44, and I will say the same thing. Let these words sink into your ears. If any of you here this morning sitting have the guts today to make this decision, to take Jesus at his word, 
then you will find what Jesus says is true and is powerful. We read earlier that Jesus says to live is to die. That's strange. That to save your life, you got to lose it. That's also strange. Jesus says, I'll paraphrase, that if you're living for yourself, then you're going, well, then you're losing it. If you're living for yourself, then you're losing it. You'll be a, a loser, you know? Loser, right? You'll be a loser if you try to live for yourself. What makes me happy? What makes me content? Well, if it's all about me, I will be miserable. That to me is radical. That to me is incredible. That to me is life changing. Jesus came. It tells us in the word that we may have life and an abundant life at that. And I want to encourage you before we get into the teaching this morning that if you live for Jesus, because I want you to remember that if you live for Jesus and you take him literally at his word, that you will see how powerful Jesus' words really are. Verses 37 through 42 of Luke chapter 9. Now it happened on the next day when they had come down from the mountain that a great multitude met him. Suddenly... A man from the multitude cried out, saying, Teacher, I implore you, look at my son, for he is only, he's my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him and suddenly cries out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth, and it departs from him with great difficulty, bruising him. So I implored your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. And as he was still coming, the demon threw him down and convulsed him. Then Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the child, and gave him back to his father. We've read the story, and there's an incredible thing that's happening here as they've just come... Uh, coming down from the mountain, Peter, James, and John, if you read previously, they've come down now from the what we call the Mount of Transfiguration. They've come from this place that was just incredible, this place to where they saw the future glory of, of Jesus and the glory for themselves as well if they hung in there. And there he was with Elijah and Moses, and they've had this incredible mountaintop experience. But Jesus then They come down and they're met with this young boy who's demon-possessed and his father comes to Jesus and says, Listen, I I ask that your disciples would would expel this, this demon, but you know what? They couldn't. They couldn't do it. Yet Jesus then turns to his disciples or turns to the group and says, Oh, faithless and perverse generation. Why did he say this? What was the thing that was going on? Well, if you have been with us, chapter 9, verse 1, if you want to turn there, it says, Then he called his twelve disciples together and did what? And gave them power and authority over all demons to cure diseases. So if Jesus has given them all power and all authority over to all their demons and to cure diseases, why could they not do that in this case? See, Jesus was amazed, I believe, that he'd given them this power and this authority, yet they could not do what they were capable of doing. In the book of Romans, Paul tells us that gifts and powers are without repentance, those that are given to us, meaning that Jesus, in the gifting and the, and the abilities of which he's given you, he will never take them away. Once he gives them, 
they stay. The gifts and the callings, Paul says, are without repentance means that he's not going to say, you know what, I gave you that gift and you know what, I'm going to take it back now. Jesus won't do that. It's not what he's about. But this is something, there's something going on here that I think we need to look at. And I want you to understand this particular portion of Scripture that may be a way that you've heard it taught previously or in the past. There's something so incredible going on here with the giftings and the abilities from chapter 9, verse 1 to now as Jesus is saying, what is going on with you guys? Faithless and perverse generation. They could not heal this young boy of this demon possession. But I want you to hear this. That even though, even though the gifts and the callings are in place, those things that God has given you are there, in their exercising, they are or they can be ineffective. Of no use. How do I know that? Well, our scripture shows us, does it not? Our scripture shows us that Jesus had given them all power and authority over demons and to heal. Yet they could not do it. So even though you may have giftings and talents and abilities, those giftings and talents still can be very ineffective in the exercising of them. They're not automatic. You don't click on a switch like a light switch in this room and bing, you've got your giftings and talents in full bore 100 miles an hour and there you go. doesn't work that way. It's not like autopilot either that we exist on or run on. I believe this is where people get really messed up because God uses you in various ministries but then the effectiveness loses its power, its punch. Why? Because it's not being maintained. It's not being maintained. Jesus said in this particular account, hey, listen up. Without prayer and fasting, you could not do this. That's the maintaining for this purpose except through prayer and fasting. Also in Matthew 17, 21, it's more of a detailed account of this situation. You see, the power won't and the power can't be maintained without maintaining through prayer and fasting, having a prayer life, talking to God, sitting with the Lord, being in devotions, If you're not doing that, yet you think you have all these giftings and talents and abilities, guess what? You have them because they're given without repentance, without reproach. However, when you need them the most, you're not going to be in touch. You're not going to be in tune. You're not going to be maintained. It's just like a car. If you don't maintain the vehicle, the motor, then it's not going to work when you need it most. Amen? You understand? You see, that's what Jesus is saying here through this. Oh man, a year ago, oh, I was doing so much in the fellowship. Oh, a year ago, I was doing this and I was doing evangelism and I was going out and I was all this stuff and doing so many things, but now, oh, you're a big flop. It's not working anymore. Something's just not right. Well, I'll tell you, it's because you don't see Jesus and His power. See, the motor is there, but there's no fuel. Jesus says, I gave you the authority. I gave you the ability. I gave you the opportunity. But why? What's going on? Why why am I not effective in my ministry? Why am I not effective in my home? Why am I not effective with my spouse? Why am I not effective with my children? Why am I not effective on my job? Why am I so ineffective? 
Why were these guys so ineffective in the ability to, that was given to them? Why could they not purge this demon? Because they weren't praying nor fasting. For you and I, we might think because they weren't reading their Bibles. Because they weren't seeking the Lord. They weren't praying to the Lord. They weren't being fed weekly because they weren't going to Bible studies. Or they didn't have their own devotional life. And they wonder, why am I ineffective? Why can I not do these things? Some things require prayer and fasting. Jesus says in verse 41, an interesting quote of his saying, a faithless, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. He says, how long am I going to bear this with you? See, I wonder about the apostles, because if you read ahead, you know that the apostles are going to be striving and asking the Lord. And in Matthew's account, we have more of a detailed explanation in the fact that it's uh, James and John, their mom, who they ask, you know, go to Jesus, go to Jesus, ask him if we can sit at his right and his left hand. You see, they're all vying for power. They're all vying for position. They all want to be sitting at the right and left hand of Jesus. And I believe that these guys are like, you know, I'm not going to pray. Man, Jesus gave us the power and authority, and I don't need to pray, man. Maybe you need to pray, but I'm not going to pray. Well, I'm not going to pray because I don't need to pray. Who knows what was going on? But I subject this to you that I believe that these guys, in knowing what the next Scripture tells us, staying in context of the Word, we see that, hey, there probably was some jealousy going on. Remember, it was Peter, James, and John, the only three that were called to go away with Jesus. Not all the rest. A little jealousy going on possibly here. What do they get to go up with Jesus? Why do we always stay here and we've got to like, you know, stoke the fire and we've got to like, you know, uh, make the food and, and go into Samaria and make sure everything's right, you know, while those three always get to go with Jesus. What are we, you know, chop liver? Well, not for them, you know. A burned falafel? I don't know. You, you say it, whatever it is. Oh, I'm not going to pray because I don't get to go away with Jesus like the other three and so therefore I'm not going to be used. I don't feel like I'm, I'm being used in the way that I want according to my own gospel. So Jesus says, hey man, you guys are faithless and guess what? You're kind of perverse too. Know that the word perverse isn't what you and I may think but in the language it means twisted. Just twisted, twisted in your thought, twisted in your perception, twisted in how you're looking at things, twisted in the heart. But this is the good news, that yet even though we fail, like the apostles, even though they've blown it, and we can, I can identify myself with these guys where they're at at this time, the good news is that Jesus never fails, and that Jesus will never fail you. It's a promise, and I want you to believe it, and I want you to live it. Believe it and live it. The promises of Christ never fail, and they will never fail you. It's not that prayer and fasting makes you and me more worthy to cast out any demons. It's not about that. But prayer and fasting in this case here and maybe other cases of your life, the reason is, is to draw you closer to the heart of God and more away from your own wicked heart like mine. To draw you closer to Him and to be more in line with His power. Something else is interesting here in this account that I find very interesting but very true. It tells us that, and as he was still coming, speaking of the young boy, the demon threw him down and convulsed him. Wow. So even as Jesus said, okay, bring the boy here, that demon to the last second wants to mess with this young boy. 
And I think about that spiritually in our lives. That when we've been in the world and when we've been doing what we've been doing or maybe we're even in church and we're living one, one foot in the church and one foot in the world and we're doing all this and all that and we finally make a decision and we purpose it in our hearts and we say, Lord, no, I am going to be committed to you. I'm going to follow you no matter what. I am purposing in my heart to do this. Guess what? You think the enemy's going to let you go that quickly and say, oh, cool, look at Tom. Oh, he's made a decision to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus, right? I sing that song in my heart and I am so happy and I'm going forward. And you think, you really think that the enemy's happy? You really think that he's pleased? You think that he's going to just step aside and have you just go be with Jesus? Well, then you just don't know The spiritual warfare that goes on. It tells us in Ephesians. We don't wrestle against flesh. but principalities and powers that are way beyond your control and way beyond your strength. So even when you decide and say, Lord, I am making a decision for you. Lord, I am going forward for you. I am going to not do these things anymore. I'm going to be 100% for you, God. Oh, remember, the enemy doesn't like it. And the enemy is going to try and get his last hit in on you in whatever way he can. Whatever it is. If you're leaving sin, you're allowing the enemy to deceive you or to trick you in some way or you're dabbling or you're flirting in, in, and being involved in sin of some sort, guess what? You say enough is enough. I'm done. I am I don't know. Stick a fork in me. I'm done, right? I've had it. I've had it living on this side. But I want to go where the light is. And as you do, the enemy has had a hold on you. And he won't let you go that easily. He wants to inflict whatever he can up to the last minute on you. He wants to distract you in whatever he can. And he wants to do that before you get to Jesus, before you want to make your right life right with Jesus. He wants just the last minute like this boy here. He's going to throw him on the ground. He's going to throw you on the ground. He's going to throw me on the ground. And he's going to beat us up one more time or try to. If you're here today and you've been trying to get that way back to Christ, and you've been trying to get that way back to Jesus. You said, I've had enough. Definitely, I'm done. And you're trying to make that way back, but you're saying, Lord, it has been really hard. I've been having attacks. I've been having problems. Things have been coming out of left field that I've never even thought about before or that I never even was involved with before, but things are just coming around out of the woodwork. Oh, well, why are you surprised? The enemy's had you. And he doesn't want to let you go. End of discussion. That's what he's about. And he will try and hold on to you, distract you, dissuade you, depress you in whatever way possible so that you will not walk to Jesus. Let me tell you, I will crawl bloody and broken if if need be to get to my Jesus. The second part of verse 42, it says, Then Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the child, and gave him back to his father. Verse 43, And they were all amazed at the majesty of God. But well, everyone marveled at the things which Jesus said. He said to his disciples, Let, this sink, let these words sink down into your ears. For the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. But they did not understand this saying, and it was hidden from them so that they did not perceive it and they were afraid to ask him about this saying why should jesus say this at this time man uh, incredible thing has gone on it says here that they were all amazed all the people were amazed at the the healing of this boy and then all of a sudden he kind of turns to his disciples in quiet and he says let these words his listen up to me let these words sink 
down into your ears, meaning let them go deep. After casting out a demon, rebuking his disciples, he reminds them, guys. He's reminding them that his mission has not changed that he has still come to die on the cross for our sins. He says, for the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of man. He says, listen guys, you see all this going on. You see what's been happening already. Let me tell you, let me remind you, my mission, my mission hasn't changed at all. I'm still going to the cross and I'm still going to die. You see, The path of Jesus, the path of Jesus wasn't to fame. The path to Jesus wasn't to prestige. The path to Jesus wasn't to power. The path that Jesus took was suffering by the cross. And Jesus calls all of his followers. That's you and I here in this room. If we say that we are Christ followers and if we say that we love Jesus and we've committed and submitted our lives to him and to the cross, then for all followers, this is the same path that you and I are to partake. We're called to give up our possessions, our securities, our finances, and put Jesus Christ first. First, I'm not saying go and sell everything today when you get home. But I'm saying that the priority, the preeminence in our lives must always be, first and foremost, Jesus Christ. That's where you must be if you call yourself a follower of Christ. A follower means that you follow Jesus. You put him first. Jesus, I love it. After all of this happening and people just like saying, wow, they're amazed. Didn't fill Jesus with pride for the things that he had done? Why? Because he knew his path. He knew his path wasn't to be paved with glory. And he knew his path wasn't to be paved with honor. But yet with suffering. And this isn't the first time that Jesus reminds his disciples, but it's the second time that he tells them, I'm going to die. And in verse 45, the Spirit did not allow these guys to understand because the time was not right for them to understand. They're still thinking about an earthly kingdom. They're still thinking that, man, I don't even want to hear from your lips, Lord, that you're going to die because if you say you're going to die, that means everything that we've thought of as Jews that this kingdom is going to be set up ain't going to happen because you, as far as we can see and we believe, you're the Messiah. You're the Christ. So don't even tell us. I don't want to hear about the fact that, there are, that you're going to die. They didn't want to hear it. Verse 46 through 48, then a dispute arose among them as to which of them would be greatest. So right after Jesus says, guess what, guys? Remember my mission, I'm gonna die. Here these guys are arguing. That's what a dispute means. And Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a little child and sat by him and said to them, whoever receives this little child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him, being God who sent me, for he who is least among you all will be Great. They're arguing. They're disputing. Over in the corner. Over there away from Jesus. Why? Because of what they were arguing about. They're like, we don't want Jesus to hear us. We don't want him to hear what's going on. But Jesus being God, he perceives, he hears their hearts. I I see it this way, as I chuckle at these guys. Because I think we can all look at the apostles and definitely go, yeah, that's me. Oh, yeah, I've done that before. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I can definitely see that as it's a mirror in my face. That when you start saying how great you are about something, about yourself, it's when you've really blown it. 
You know what I'm talking about. When you've really blown it, oh, 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 but, 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 no, 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 no. Actually, I can really do it this way better. Yeah, I just didn't have the opportunity here nor the time there to be able to do what I needed. But otherwise, I could have done it. I would have been really good at it. Would have turned out much better. Hey, I, I've got my act together. We always say this when we fail. These guys, these 12, were failures. After all Jesus had given to them, they knew on the inside that they had failed. Even after Jesus told them they were going to die, they begin arguing over what positions they're going to have in an earthly kingdom. See, and you can always tell, I can always tell, I think, when a person is inwardly aware of their shortcomings, think back. Because they'll always let you know how great they are. They're all insecure about their shortcomings. And they want to then boast upon how great they are. Listen, a person who is truly great never has to talk about it. A person who is truly great never has to bring up their abilities or their attributes. Jesus gives them the object lesson by this little child. And he says, listen, in a way, he says, stop your arguing. Just stop it. Just kind of like, shut your traps, guys. You know, be quiet. The least among you is the greatest. Another radical teaching by Jesus. The least among you is greatest. Their attention, where was it? It was somewhere else. Jesus wants to continually prepare his guys for what is in store for them. Yet they were concerned too much about themselves and their glory and their fame and their honor. Jesus called this little child lowly. You have to understand, in the time and given the culture, children, for you little guys that are here this morning, sorry about this, but you know what? Hey, you didn't even speak, Glenn. You didn't speak, man. You didn't say nothing. You guys, you didn't. You guys were nothing back in those days. And I'm sorry. Things have changed. Praise the Lord. But you know what? In those days, man, oh man, if you were a little child, you were not seen, you were not heard. And what's interesting here is that by showing them this little child to these 12 men, He's showing them that their perception, their priorities are all wrong. That in their wanting to be great, that in this illustration with this little child, Jesus now shows them truly greatness. Do you understand? There's a difference between great and greatness. Jesus says to have greatness, you must be like this little child. Jesus is showing them that they are peers. They're even with this little child. Greatness will always be measured, I believe, by attitude towards serving or service. This means what Jesus has already taught us, denying yourself. Jesus wants you to evaluate yourself. Are you always striving to be the greatest? Or are you really truly looking for opportunities to serve. We'll end there today. But I want to leave you with a few things as the ushers come forward and the worship team comes forward. Where is your heart at? What has God shown you in your area of serving and how you view yourself and the giftings and the talents of which God is giving you. Remember, they're not automatic. But you need to be in prayer. You need to be seeking the Lord. And that also, although His giftings are without repentance, you need to maintain. You need to maintain your walks with the Lord. And if you are a believer of Jesus Christ, you're a follower, Jesus said, deny yourself 
Come after me, pick up your cross, and follow me. Submit yourself to Jesus. That's what it's about, guys. You, look at your lives. I gotta look at mine all the time. What am I submitting myself to? Am I submitting myself to every whim of every person in this church? Am I submitting myself to the ministry itself as it's its own kind of animal? that it kind of moves me along like a rushing river? Or am I submitted to Jesus and what He wants? I always have to look, where am I or how or who am I submitted to? And so I want you to think about things this morning. I want you to think about things this morning. As we go through communion, if there are things in your life that you know you need to, must get right with Jesus, hey, we have had so many what they call natural disasters out there. Their time is short. Things are happening. We heard from Carrie this morning. You don't wait till the last minute. You don't wait till the last minute. Time is now. And if you find that you're reorienting yourself into this walk of Jesus. You're kind of getting yourself back into it. Hey, this is my first time in church in a long time. And, or, gee, you know, uh, it's been a while. Or maybe I haven't been reading my, the Bible enough. Or, gosh, you know, I know that God is, 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 is doing something in me. He's doing something. I don't know what. I can't put a finger on it. But, oh, he's doing something. You know, if that's you here this morning, really, truly, We're not in times of fooling around anymore, guys. We're not here to play church. But we're here to get real with Jesus. No matter what age you are, no matter how long you've walked with Jesus, it's time to get serious with Jesus in these times. Jesus has given us a huge wake-up call. The Lord has given us a huge wake-up call that you and I, man, we have no power against His mighty hand. He turns the oceans. He blows the wind right in our face and it's like there's nothing we can do about it except pray well don't wait till it's too late if you want to make an amends with your Lord your Savior here this morning and it's been tough it's been tough getting there it's been tough moving in that direction you know what no the enemy wants to hold you back no the enemy wants to kind of get a toehold on you he's had this hold upon your heel or upon your foot he wants to not let you go he wants to keep you don't fool around with your eternal life don't mess with eternity I'd like you to as the ushers now begin to pass out the elements I'd like you just to hold them and I'd like you just to meditate upon the message this morning maybe something has touched your heart I don't know but I believe the Holy Spirit is real faithful and and I trust Him maybe some part of this message this morning has maybe convicted you or done something. I pray that it moves you into a direction that is closer with Jesus. Just sit with the Lord right now.
Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time, God, that we can just sit just right here. Lord, I pray. I pray, Lord, that you will reveal to us, Lord, your plan. That you will, God, minister your love to us here this morning. That, Lord, that the things that we have, the things that you bless, Lord, are truly from you. And that, God, that it's nothing of us. And that, Lord, that now that we even sit here before communion, which just means oneness, that we can sit here in oneness with you, Lord. Lord, it's our desire to know you. It's our desire, Lord God, to sit at your feet. Lord, let us learn from the scriptures this morning what you desire that we truly have a walk that is one of a child one that is humble one that is meek one Lord that is submitted to you in all ways and Lord this morning as we celebrate this time of communion it's a celebration of your submission to the Father and to going to the cross I thank you for that, Lord, that the decision that you made to go to the cross was made in the garden, that you said yes. I thank you, Lord, for taking on our sins. I thank you, Lord, for the burden that you've taken upon and away from us, that, Lord, that we can live in a freedom, that, Lord, that we can live in a freeness that is only provided by you. Lord, I pray for everyone here that, Lord, that they not be heavy burdened, that they not be heavy laden, that, Lord, that they know you so well and so deep, Lord, that they know that your burden is light, that it's not heavy, that, Lord, that following you, that being a follower of you, Lord, denying themselves, God, the submitting themselves to you, Lord, is life. Lord, there is life found in you by your son, Jesus. So, Lord, this morning, if there are any of us here that don't know you, God, I pray, Lord, that right now they ask you into their hearts, that I pray, God, that they say, Lord, I am a sinner. I am undeserving. But will you come into my life? Will you make me new again, Lord? May you make me complete. Love me, Lord. It's all we want. It's all we ask. It's what we need is your love. If there are those here that have been just not walking rightly with God and the enemy's been pulling at them, having that toehold upon them, that God, that, that you will strengthen them to persevere and to continue on through so that they will see that prize, Lord. Your apostle tells us, Lord, in Romans that that one prize, that one thing that he knows that he will not give up on because it's worth it. Lord, it is worth my death that I know you. It is worth my dying that I live. there are those here, Lord, that need to get their lives right with you, Lord. Let them do it today. If you're struggling today, Jesus loves you. If you're in a trial today, Jesus loves you. Know Jesus by his promises. Know Jesus by his words. 
have the guts this morning, I pray, to take Jesus literally at his word. For that, you must know him. Otherwise, you won't get it. We lift these things up to you, Lord. We thank you for dying on the cross for us. We thank you that we rejoice and we remember the awesome work you did for us, Lord, this morning. Lord, thank you for the work on Calvary. Thank you for your resurrection. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for your life and the life we have in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all partake. If there are any of you here this morning who would like prayer, we would love to pray for you. There'll be guys and gals up here to pray for you here this morning. If you were one of those ones who dedicated your lives this morning, um, come up and get prayed for. I want to give you something. If that's you, come and see me personally. If you've rededicated your life, if you've asked God to come on back into your life and you said, Lord, you know what? I need you back. I'm walking, but it's tough. I'm walking, but you know what, Lord, it's hard. There's so many things, God. There's so many things, Lord, that are pulling me back and holding me back. Well, you need to come up here for prayer. You need to. You need the prayer of the saints for you. If you're one of those that has been walking around in your own strength and you find that the giftings that God has given you just kind of are tapped out. You're like, man, I'm kind of wasted right now. I'm just kind of tired. (sighs) Nothing's working. Nothing's working. You got to get back into that maintenance program with Jesus. You have to. Pray. Read your word. Seek accountability. Seek prayer. I'll say this. Don't be a bunch of spiritual wimps, huh? I say that with all love. But you're soldiers for Christ. You're soldiers. You've enlisted into an army that is like none other. It's greater than the United States of America Army, Navy, Marines. It's better. It's greater. It's more powerful. It's just the best. Trust Jesus. You need to trust him. And love him. Because he loves you. God bless you guys. You are dismissed. Enjoy Labor Day here in Williamsburg. If you need prayer, please come forward. We love you. God bless you. Bye-bye.